The title of his talk today is Children's Friendships, Peer Cultures, and Adult-Child Relations in Preschools. So a very uh, short introduction to Professor Cassaro. He basically, you know, was the inspiration of my own PhD research um, for a very long time. Uh, it was focused on um, children's thinking and their uh, friendships and peer culture as well. But I didn't last as long in pursuing that thread of research as he did. Um, Professor Cusaro has spent almost his whole lifetime really um, researching into children's friendships and peer cultures. So today he will share with us um, much of his work that was based in Italy, done with colleagues there, and uh, do a little bit of comparison with um, the American settings that he's very used to. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over the time to Professor Cassaro. If I could just um, encourage everybody to uh, just hang in there. The lecture will be about an hour long, after which I will invite all of you to, you know, just ask questions or post comments, either in the chat box or to unmute yourself and just have a little interaction with um, Bill Cassaro here. Okay. So thank you, everyone. Enjoy. So, Bill, over to you. You can unmute yourself. Now you can hear me? Yes, perfect. <laughs> okay. So you can see the, the title of the talk in the, the first slide there. Um, and uh, before I start, I, I should say that I'm relying on data collected in a number of different field sites uh, in Italy, uh, in Bologna, Italy from 1983 to 1986, and then uh, more recently in Modena, Italy from 1996 until 2001 or two. Uh, and also from the United States in a government supported Head Start program from 1989 till 1990, and then a private uh, non-for-profit preschool in Bloomington, Indiana uh, from 1989 until 1992. And most of the comparison is going to be between uh, the Modena study and the one in, in Bloomington, Indiana. Now, peer culture and adult child relations is a topic I have a lot of experience with in my many years of research in early education settings. However, because my research is primarily focused on children's friendships and peer cultures, I've less often addressed adult-child relations. When I have discussed adults in my research, it's usually teachers and how they influence peer culture, or more recently, how they prepare children for the transition from preschool to elementary school. However, my more recent research in Modena, Italy has made me aware of the importance of how children's peer cultures are affected by their relationships of the family and the community with children in, in preschool and elementary school institutions. In this study, my Italian colleague, Luisa Molinari and I conducted a longitudinal ethnography of a group of children's transition from preschool to elementary school. We then continued to observe and follow the children throughout elementary school and on to middle school. In doing so, we not only experienced the process of transition with the children, but we also interviewed teachers and parents. We also participated in field trips, parties, and activities in the schools involving parents and grandparents, and attended larger community events for children over a seven year period. This research, when compared with my earlier work in preschools in the United States, made me more aware of the vital role adults, teachers, parents, community leaders, and volunteers can play in supporting and enriching young children's peer cultures. Today, I want to share some of these insights by comparing my experiences in Italy and the United States, looking, looking first at teachers and then going on to consider family members and then finally, the community more generally. Oops. No, it's not. 
not letting me go to the next slide for some reason. Oh, there we go, okay. So first we'll talk about teachers in pure culture in the United States and Italy in, in various ways. A major factor affecting teacher-child relations in early education settings is the structure and organization of classes. Most preschools and all elementary schools structure children into age groups. However, a big difference between Italy and the United States is that in Italy, children normally stay together in the same group with the same teachers throughout their time in these educational institutions for three years in preschool and five years in elementary school. Well, in the United States, children normally change teachers and often group composition as children move from one group or class to another. In Italy, we found that keeping teachers and children together resulted in strong communal bonds between teachers and students, close relationships between teachers and parents, and highly integrated peer cultures. Now I wanna talk particularly about individual teacher-child relations. At the individual level in Italy, teachers identify the strengths and needs of particular children and have ample time to address them both in individual interactions and in group projects. Thus, the diagnosis of a child's particular needs and strengths and plans of actions in the activities of the group, individually with the child and in communication with parents takes place over longer periods of evaluation and practice. In the United States, in contrast, the identification of a student's strengths and especially needs must take place quickly and often without sufficient observation before moving to plans of action. In our interviews with teachers in Modena, we were struck by their insights in their evaluation of the children over time. How some children started out with strong academic or social skills, which the teachers built on and nourished, while other children needed special attention to help early on, but made excellent progress, both academically and socially. Also, the teachers were aware of any personal family problems or disruptions that could affect individual children's behavior or progress in the school due to frequent family meetings and excellent rapport with families. On the other hand, even the best teachers in my work in the United States felt some children had not made the progress they would have liked during the one school year they had with them. They wish they had more time to work with such children and bemoan the fact that they were that they were relative that there was relatively little interaction with parents. I want to talk about teacher children interaction and group activities in these settings. At the group level, keeping teachers and children together over multiple years has important positive effects on teacher child relationships in several ways. In most preschools, the curriculum is composed of meeting times for planning and discussion, teacher-directed short and long-term projects, and free play in various parts of the classrooms and outside areas, which are conducive to a variety of types of play. Now, meeting times in Italian and American preschools differed significantly in terms of the way the teachers and children interacted with each other. In the private American preschool, for four and five-year-olds I studied in, in Bloomington, Indiana, meeting time would usually begin with routines in which individual children had the opportunity to perform certain tasks related to their developing literacy. For example, the teachers chose a child to print the numer numerical date on a calendar, select a picture which corresponded to the, to the day's weather, and then finish by printing her or his name on a small back, uh, blackboard. They usually asked for volunteers and then chose children to do this. And the kids relished their opportunity to participate in these activities, especially the printing of their names, which all of them could do without help. Then after a short good morning greeting and sometimes a song, each child took a turn offering something to the group in a show and tell format. Usually children selected books to talk about during their turns. However, children could also display and talk about a picture, present a narrative about something that happened to them, or display and talk about their journals. 
Now the talk about journals was infrequent, but much encouraged by the teachers. Now compared to the meeting times in Italian schools, which we'll consider shortly, things were subdued in the American preschool. Normally each child's turn at talk was brief with little response from other children or the teachers. In many, case, in many cases, it was difficult to hear the kids. And I was surprised when the teacher did not ask them to speak louder. On a few occasions, one or the other of the children said they couldn't hear, and then the teacher would ask for a repetition. Re repetition. It seemed that the teachers were most interested in each individual child getting his or her turn with some short feedback. Now the kids often got bored waiting for their turns and had to be corrected for talking or not paying attention. They weren't supposed to be talking while the other children were presenting. The children suddenly displayed their general displeasure with the boredom of meeting time with their own routine, which was a negative comment on literacy. After finishing their turn when talking about a book, which most children did, many of the kids held the book over their head and then let it drop behind them loudly to the floor. Now, early in the school year, other kids laughed loudly when they heard this thud of the dropped book. However, when the teachers reacted negatively to both the book dropping and the laughter, the laughter was replaced by sly smiles, yet the book dropping continued. On other occasions, embellishments of literacy activities during a child's turn became a type of resistance to the general structure of meaning time. Here, creativeness and literacy activities help the kids break free from the stifling nature of the turn-taking routine. After several weeks, one boy, David, disposed with bringing a book to meeting time and would often offer to tell a story. These narratives were in the genre of ghost stories, and they got more complex over the school term. All the stories involved David being in bed at night and hearing noises which awoke him. He told each story in a dramatic fashion, describing hearing footsteps coming up the stairs, the steps getting closer to his room, and the door opening slowly. But then he would laugh and say it was just his mother, father, his dog, and one time a visiting aunt. Now the other kids appreciated these stories and laughed loudly at the simple ending after the big buildup. The teachers liked the stories at first, but grew uneasy about having to quiet the children down every time David decided to narrate his bedtime tales. In the Italian preschools I studied in Modena, meetings were held every day after a morning snack and normally lasted 45 minutes to an hour or more. The meetings usually began with general talk, general talk about plans for the day, or on Mondays or on holidays, or after holidays, detailed discussions about things the children had done and experienced in their days away from school. In every case, the first part of the meeting set the general tone of the overall meeting itself to give all the children an opportunity to have something to say and to contribute as members of the group. Sometimes discussion of plans for the day and personal experiences took up most, if not all, of the meeting time. The teachers never seemed worried about this and had a very open conception of time that was not related to strict schedules. The discussions were lively with all the children participating and frequently interrupting each other to offer their own opinions and thoughts on the comments of their teachers and peers. The Italian phrase, secondo me, which means in my opinion, often preceded long terms of talk by a particular child with other children and the teachers quick to respond in agreement or disagreement. The importance placed on discussione of this type has been well documented in Italian schools and families in my research and the, in the research of others. During meeting time, there was also a strong display of emotion and community. The teachers were often physically affectionate with the children, but they also joked and teased them and were not hesitant to enter disputes and debates with the kids. The teachers and children's interactive styles during meeting time and more generally are undoubtedly related to the nature of presentation of self in Italian culture. But there's more to it than this. There has developed a strong sense of community and trust in this group that have been together on an everyday basis for ne nearly three years 
And it really, and it is a key element in the Italian early education philosophy of the Emilia Romagna curriculum. In the American school, most of the projects were short term and that they usually occurred over the course of one day or possibly two. The general pattern was for the teachers to introduce the project at the end of this circle, uh, uh, circle time and, and uh, show and tell time. And the children would work together on the projects in small groups with teachers entering now and then to give directions and to ask and answer questions. One project involved a discussion of animals and pets and one of the teachers, Karen, brought her two large black and white dogs to visit the children. This was pretty unusual. It's the only time that I remember animals being brought to the school. So this is a big event. The dogs were well behaved and a few kids went up and patted and hugged them. Karen told the kids that the dogs told the kids the dogs names and pointed out that one dog was missing some fur from her tail. She said the dog was lost for two days and they and they found her caught under a fence that had barbed wire. When the dog saw Karen, she pulled herself away from the fence to run to her and in the process lost some of her fur. The kids were very attentive to this story and showed a lot of sympathy toward the dog by hugging her and stroking her tail. The teachers later built on the visit of the dog and literacy events related to it by setting up a project about animals. In the following excerpt from my field notes, we see two children uh, working on the project. Now I'm just gonna let you read uh, what I've written here in my field notes, and then I'll talk about them a bit. Now this example nicely captures children's extending literacy events first presented to them by the teachers in circle time. Several literacy activities are blended into the events. First at circle time, the children visit with and pet the dogs which have been brought to school. And then they hear the story about how one of the dogs was injured when temporarily lost from home and caught in a fence. The, the teachers followed up these activities with this general project in which children could color pictures of animals. Now, Carrie and Rita select lions to color, but tie into the early narrative about the injured dog. The girls collectively build their own narrative, which is like the one they heard, but now they say the lions they are drawing were injured. They go further to remedy the situation by using aspects of their material culture, the marking pins, to heal the lion's injuries by polishing their tails with the magic markers. Their fantasy narratives are taken a step further when Rita suggests that cutting their lions out of the paper is a way of setting them free, much in the same way the dog was free from the fence and reunited with her owners. Now, in the Italian preschool, the teachers and children participated together in a number of long term projects. Almost all the projects were long-term over several months and involved three phases, a planning phase, a doing phase, and a reproductive phase. Now, during these projects, there were frequent discussions among the whole group at meeting times, and then the teachers would work with small groups of individual children on various aspects of the projects. One project involved reading, discussing, and then reproducing verbally in verbally in writing and in art, the story of the Wizard of Oz over around a three month period. The teachers read and discussed the book with the children during meeting time over a six week period. And I should also say when the, the teachers read any stories to the children in, in Italy, they never just read stories. Stories were not just to be read, they were to be discussed and debated. And if, if children didn't have questions or didn't interrupt and, and ask questions, the children, the teachers would stop reading and ask them what they thought about what was happening in the story. This was never the case 
in any, any school that I saw in the United States. Stories were just read to children and then questions were taken. Now these discussions were often complex and animated and sometimes little reading got done. <laughs> to my American mind, it seemed as if we would never finish the book. The teachers were very relaxed and again did not stick to a rigid schedule, but clearly had long-term goals for the project in mind. Now near the end of the reading and discussion, the children and teachers produced a large mural with the Emerald Castle in the background and the four main characters constructed of items like tin foil, straw, yarn, buttons, and so on placed in the foreground as we see in this next slide. So this took several days to, uh, to complete the mural, which all the children worked on together. With the reading of the story and the mural completed, the teachers worked individually with the children, asking questions about the story, their favorite character, their favorite scene, and so on. The children's responses were recorded on audio tape. Later, these responses were written up in a small workbook in which the children copied their narratives that the teachers had printed out for them. Now, some children were able to do all the printing on their own and others needed help from the teachers. In the same workbook, each child drew a picture of their favorite character and printed the name of the character under the, under the picture. Now, later in, in a group meeting, the children and teachers discussed how the story was made up of a set of scenes and they decided which child would draw which scene. Over a three week period, the children working in small groups with the teacher made sketches of their selected scenes. Each child then described his or her sketch scene to the teacher and with spelling help printed out the description on a separate piece of paper. The children then produced their pictures and paintings and in, in, in paintings and collages. We can see an example of these sketches, descriptions and finished paintings in the next slides. So here's Federica's sketch of her scene from The Wizard of Oz. And this is her description of the scene from The Wizard of Oz. And this reads, the Wizard of Oz and Dorothy go with the air balloon to Dorothy's house because Dorothy wants to return to her aunt and uncle's house far to be happy. I'm, I'm reading it literally uh, from the Italian. Now, later, as we see, all these sketches and then the, the very beautiful drawings from the sketch and descriptions were uh, displayed on the walls of the school. And this is typical for all of these long-term projects at this school. The walls are covered with, with things that children have been doing in these projects. And so when parents and others come to the school, they can, the children can tell them what they've been doing and they can of course uh, see them as well. Now, later in a, in a, in a, a meeting time after uh, all these uh, sketches and things had been finished, the teacher said, let's take the sketches down from the wall Okay, and they would they just took the sketch itself, not the painting. Uh, and the child, each child held the sketch in their in their in their uh, lap with the description. And the teacher said, "Well, what happened first? You know, so each child said, "Well, mine happened first, or, or Eliza's happened first, or whatever." And then they decided what happened first, and then that sketch and description was. Uh, placed on the floor, and we then just proceeded until we had the whole story reproduced in front of us again on the floor uh, in, in front of the, uh, the, the seats at meeting time. Now, later, toward the end of the year, the teachers took, took all these sketches uh, and the descriptions and photocopied them and made a new book of The Wizard of Oz by arranging the scenes in order with the children's input and help. So all the children received copies of the book to take with them at the end of the year. And I got my copy as well. <laughs> there it is. Uh, I still have it after these many years. Uh, and again, this was very important to the children to take uh, 
uh, home with them, as well as at the end of the year, their productions were taken down from the wall to take home as well. Thus, each child individually contributed, contributed again to a collective literacy project, which they were able to keep as part of their material culture. In this example, the collective nature of the long-term project results in a blending of the school and peer cultures as the literacy event becomes part of the group experience and is important to the children's shared activity in the setting. The activity is also a group production in which children ha have made an individual and unique, which each child has made an individual and unique contribution. Now, I'm now going to uh, go on to talk about teacher intervention into free play in the two schools. In addition to interaction with individual students and work with groups of students, teachers in both American and Italian preschools allowed for a substantial amount of free play in the various areas of the school, inside playhouses and outside swings and climbing structures and so on, and with play materials such as sand, block, sand blocks, dolls, toy animals, and so on. Time for pre free play is essential for young children's construction of a complex and vibrant peer culture. One of the best ways to promote this peer culture is for teachers to intervene only as a last resort. Kids feel empowered and in control during free play and quick intervention by teachers, even when there are problems and disputes can stifle the peer culture. This is my opinion. On the whole, teachers in the American preschools as compared to Italian teachers were more likely to intervene in children's free play, most especially when there were disputes and conflict. A major reason for such intervention was that the American schools were private and parents were paying for their children's care and education and they expected such intervention. Parents did not like conflict and became quite upset if their sons or daughters came home and complained about other children upsetting them or not being their friends or so on. Now I'm going to give an example of conflict in which, in the American school, in, in which the teacher is slow to intervene, but eventually she has to. In this example, three girls, Mary, Veronica, and Megan are playing in the outside yard of the preschool. These three girls often play together and with two other girls, Peggy and Shirley. In fact, Shirley and Megan often referred to each other as best friends. I heard a lot more talk about best friends in American schools than in, in American private schools than I did in the Head Start Center or in Italy. In fact, Shirley and Megan, as I said, often referred to themselves as best friends. Now today, Mary and Veronica are pretending to be pet ponies that belong to Megan. Megan had devised this play theme and she has two pom-poms that she used to direct the pony's behavior. Now Shirley had been playing elsewhere and when she sees Megan and the others, she comes over and asks to play. Now Megan at first ignores Shirley and then says she can't play. Megan, Mary, and Veronica now move to another area of the yard, and Shirley follows and again asks to play, but Megan says she cannot. After two more unsuccessful attempts, Shirley asks Mary and Veronica to be her ponies and to abandon Megan. But Mary and Veronica refuse, and Megan tells Shirley, I said you can't play. Now, Mary and Veronica do not actually reject Shirley, but they obey Megan and continue to take their role as her pet ponies. Now this gives them a bit of freedom since they go off to play by themselves, but still be Megan's pets and return to her now and then. Now Shirley persists in trying to persuade Megan to let her play, but without success. Shirley now starts to cry and tells Megan, you're hurting my feelings. Now this you're hurting my feelings is also something I heard in the American school quite a bit. My own daughter who went to one of these schools came home and told me one of the kids was hurting her feelings one time. Uh, but again, it is something I never heard in Italy. Now, both girls now exchange threats. This is something else that I often heard in American schools. And they said they weren't gonna be best friends or best buddies anymore, or they weren't gonna get invited to birthday parties. 
if they if they if they if she didn't allow them to, if they didn't play together. Now Shirley also threatens Mary and Veronica, the other two girls, but they stick with Megan. Very eventually Shirley goes and tells a teacher that Megan is being mean and won't let me play. Now the teacher suggests that Shirley should play with someone else. And she's aware that Shirley is best friends with Megan. Now very upset, Shirley goes over and shoves Megan and Megan shoves back. Before long, both girls are crying. It's now time to go inside. And when we get inside the classroom, the teacher takes the two girls aside and talks about the problem. However, the girls refuse to make up. The teacher then tells them to sit on opposite sides of the room and think about why they are unhappy and are not being nice to each other. Later, the two girls sit on the other sides of the table during snack and still do not talk to each other. However, when I return later in the day after they've had a nap time, I see that Shirley and Megan are sitting together and watching a video with the rest of the kids and they're holding hands. So they've obviously made up. Now, in this example, the teacher refuses to intervene at first request, which is actually a little unusual in this school. But when Shirley is upset, she decided to try to get the girls to talk things over and patch up their differences. When this doesn't work, she separates them in a type of timeout that was frequently used for children who were misbehaving in the school. Again, I should point out that these timeouts did not exist in Italy. Actually, when I told Italian teachers about this, they say, what well, they put the kids in prison? Uh, and it also was not used in the Head Start centers. Now, in telling them to think about this and, and about why they were mad and unhappy does seem to be a good strategy that works. And it could be argued that their dispute in somewhat might have strengthened their relationship as it forced them to think about its importance in their lives. And a number of uh, other psychologists, especially, have written about how, in, when they talk, written about friendship, have talked about how best friends are often arguing and fighting a lot. Uh, and one guy even wrote a book, Best Friend, Worst Enemies, uh, that talked about this close relationship and high expectations that American children have of their best friends. In Italian preschools I studied, teachers are much more ca uh, cautious to intervene and they expect children, especially children who have been together for several years, to be able to settle their own conflicts and disputes. In fact, the kids I studied in Bologna and Modena often considered it a failure of the peer culture when a teacher had to intervene or settle a conflict. For example, in Modena, I frequently observed an interesting ritual when two children got into a dispute that escalated to the point that, that one child would start to cry. When the crying, when the crying started, the child not crying looked around to see if the teacher was nearby and then quickly offered up his or her arm for the other child to hit. The crying child immediately stopped crying and hit and hit very hard and now the other child wanted to cry but instead often said sobbing fa niente, that was nothing, thereby ending the dispute. In Modena, I often observed complex peace negotiations when disputes got out of hand. In each case, uninvolved kids often negotiated peace between the warring parties. Here's an example from my field notes. Carlotta and Sophia got into a dispute over whose turn it was to ride an available bicycle. There's some pushing and shoving and Carlotta stalks off angrily. I had noticed these two getting mad at each other before, but they were good friends. I now see that another girl, Eliza, is bringing Sophia over to Carlotta, so I follow close behind. Elisa tells Sophia and Carlotta to stay alone and work it out. Carlotta is quite upset, and then Steph, Steph, Stefania, Federica, and Elisa come over to Carlotta and Sophia, as does another girl, Marina. So now there's like four or five different kids involved. Elisa tells Marina to take Sophia aside and talk to her as she talks to Carlotta. Meanwhile, a boy, Renato, comes over and talks with Carlotta and Elisa. Marina brings Sophia over, and Marina makes a joke, and everybody laughs. 
but Carlotta and Sophia are still upset, and Sophia says that Carlotta is a big liar. The others try to overcome this problem. Eventually, the two do agree not to fight anymore, but they have not really fully made up. Later, when the children go inside, wash up and sit down waiting to go to lunch, I notice that Carlotta and Sophia have made up and they're sitting next to each other. They're very happy and laughing. They are also glad when Marina, who is one of the waiters for lunch, each day at, at lunch there was a child that was a waiter and they got to pick the kids who sat at their table. And Marina has selected uh, Carlotta and Sophia and they run off together happily uh, for lunch. Now this was one of several examples where a small group of children, usually four or five, work together to settle, to settle a serious rift between two of their playmates. In this instance, and in, most, in almost all the cases, a teacher or teacher became aware of the problem, but left the children alone to settle things themselves. The, chil the children saw serious conflict between or among their peers as a threat, to the strong group identity of the peer culture, and they work collaborative, collaboratively to reduce this threat and to bring about pache, our peace. We can contrast this example with the earlier one we discussed in the Bloomington Preschool. Here, when the two girls, Megan and Shirley, got into a serious dispute, other children, even the two girls playing with Megan, stayed out of the conflict. In short, the dispute was seen as a private matter and external to the group. So again, I never, almost never saw other children getting involved in the disputes of, of, of others. Now the teacher worked with the two girls to get them to talk things over, much like you know uh, the, the, the Italian children did with each other, uh, and they eventually made up. However, in the Modena preschool, disputes, as we have seen, are not viewed as private matters, but threats to the group in peer culture. I argue that this difference is related somewhat to cultural aspects. Italians and Americans look at disputes in different ways, but also to a number of interrelated factors, including the structure and organization of the schools, how long the children remain in the group with the same teachers, whether the schools are private versus public, and the nature of child, a uh, teacher-child relations. Okay, I'm now going to move to talk about families in peer culture uh, in first in American private preschools and in American Head Start centers, and then in the Italian preschools. In all the preschools I've studied, the kids created vibrant peer cultures which reflected the joy, wonder, and complexity of their childhoods. In the American preschools, the complexity of the kids' cultures was by and large hidden from most adults beyond the teachers and a few parents. In the private not-for-profit preschool I studied, I've studied in Berkeley, California, and in, in Bloomington, Indiana, and other places, the overall quality and resources of the schools were high, and there was some parent involvement. Now, not-for-private preschools are often provide high quality teaching staffs and curriculum as well as resources because tuition revenue is used only to pay for the program staff. For profit private preschools on the other hand are normally of lower quality because teachers pay, uh, teacher pay and investment in resources are often kept to a minimum to increase profits. Now, parental involvement in the private not-for-profit preschools I studied normally occurred outside the classrooms and was primarily administrative, especially by parents who served on the preschool's board of directors. There were, however, a few special events throughout a given year, like a family dinner and maybe a musical or talent performance by the children for their families. The Head Start programs, which are funded by the federal government at the local level in the United States for very poor children, I have studied, lack the resources that were typical in American private preschools or the Italian government preschools. Although federal government support of Head Start has increased since the time of my study, the programs are still limited in terms of the number of children covered and the range of program activities. The programs were in general of good quality, but when when I was studying them, they were limited to a half a day, 
some portion of which was spent on structured language and cognitive task based on compens the compensatory orientation of the program. That is, part of the curriculum assumed that these poor, often African-American children lacked certain cognitive and language skills and needed drills to help them catch up or have a head start for kindergarten. I found, on the other hand, that the drills, while teaching children to raise their hands and take turns and lessons in ways comparable to public kindergartens in first grade, often confused the kids and led them to believe there was only one right answer for any question. Now, I'm going to give you an example of one of these drills. Uh, for example, they may have had a felt board with a picture of a tree, and then they take a, a, a bird and put it you know, in the tree on the felt board. And then they will ask a child a WH question, like, where is the bird, okay? Now, I don't know how most of you would answer, but the answer to most WH questions is pretty simple. It's like, well, in the tree or on the limb or something like that. Now, this was, when children gave such answers, they were told that that was incorrect because what they were trying to generate from the kids was a complete sentences. They wanted the children to say, the bird is in the tree or the bird is on the limb, okay? Because again, they had this belief that especially African-American children don't often speak in complete sentences, which in and of itself is disputable, okay? But if you're going to have a, a curriculum task that finds out if children can speak in, in complete sentences, you shouldn't really ask WA questions WH questions, you should ask them to tell a story. <laughs> but again, I kept quiet, <laughs> it was not my responsibility. And I do not like to say bad things about Head Start uh, because it's better than, than nothing and there are a lot of good things about it. But these tasks were not uh, uh, well thought out. Now, despite the half day limitation and problems with the compensatory nature of some aspects of the curriculum, the Head Start program was highly valuable regarding the kids' social emotion and emotional development. And also it gave them one free meal a day, which was also very important uh, to them nutritionally. The kids developed a strong peer culture, which was supported by a group of caring adults in the Head Start centers. In fact, the Head Start centers are best described as small communities that emphasize collective values and providing something approaching an extended family for the kids. In a typical day at the centers, the average child came into contact with a wide range of adults, teachers and teaching assistants in their classroom, visiting parents, and parents visited often and were encouraged to do so by the teachers, bus drivers, administrative staff, social workers, speech therapists, custodians, and cooks. Although the kids spent most of their time in the centers with the teachers and assistants in their classrooms, they knew all the adults' last names and frequently exchanged greetings and playful talk. The Head Start kids always referred to adults by their last name, Mrs. Green or Mr. Uh, Brown or whatever. They never used first names like uh, 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 for adults like uh, the Italian kids did in the, in the, in the children in, the, in private preschools in the United States. Now, The adults also knew the, the children well. And in fact, some adults had favorites among the kids that they would talk to and joke with and hall, in the hallways and when they entered the classroom. Classrooms, the, 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 the kids especially uh, had close relationships with the bus drivers as they were bused to school every day. And they really got to know these uh, individuals. Now, the strong support from caring adults was very important for the Head Start kids because many of them came from single parent families and lived in poor and dangerous neighborhoods with limited opportunities for positive interaction with adults in, in, other, in other kids. Furthermore, the Head Start programs encouraged parental involvement. And as I said, several uh, parents worked in the centers regularly and the teachers visited and supported parents in their homes. The Italian preschools I studied in Bologna and Modena promoted kids' construction of complex peer cultures, which both enriched their childhoods and contributed to their development of social language and cognitive skills. 
The programs have a long history in Northern Italy dating back to the 1960s, and a high quality early education is the norm throughout Italy today with nearly 100% of all three to five year old children attend. Most of the legislation related to childcare instituted in the late 1960s and early 70s in Italy was the result of intense periods of social and political struggle, which followed the Italian economic boom of the 50s and 60s. Much of the collective and highly public political mobilization of this period was directly tied to the mass migration of Italians from rural areas throughout the country to the major cities, primarily in the north. Now, the general orientation of early childhood education in Italy reflects this collective and communal movements from which it was born. The preschool is seen as a place of life for children. Activities such as playing, eating, debating, and working together were considered just as important as those that focus on individual cognitive, intellectual development, and literacy. The communal activity is evident in the organizational structure of preschools, as well as the wide range of social, verbal, and artistic projects making up the curriculum that stress the relationship of preschool with the family, community, and children's peer culture. Regarding the structure of the preschools in Bologna, where I work, there was a mixed group of, child, of 35 children with five teachers attending all day programs from September until July, with a new group of children entering and another group leaving over, th over the three year period I observed. There's been a movement away from mixed age groups, uh, large age groups of this type uh, to, to uh, uh, age groups based on age. Uh, and that was the case uh, in Modena, where there were, uh, was there, where there were there's a group of a five-year-old, two groups of five-year-olds and uh, one three and four-year-old group. Now, again, the structure of keeping children together with the same teachers, build strong communal bonds among the children and between the children and parents. It's also important in parental participation in school programs as parents get to know each other well and develop strong relationships with the teachers. In this way, the preschool is something more than an educational institution in Italy. It is often a social and community organization for families with young children. One project in Bologna involved planning for, making, and reconstructing visits to the homes of the older kids during the spring of their final year in the school. In my first year in the preschool, I was introduced to this project in an indirect way when a boy, Felice, said, hey, Bill, you're coming to my house. Now, I wasn't sure how to respond to this, and I just nodded and said, well, that's good. And I assumed that perhaps Felice's parents were going to invite me for a visit. However, a few days later, in a group meeting, the teachers told us about the family visits. Then each of the older kids talked about their families and the preparations they were making for our visits. Now, all of this sounded really exciting to me and the three-year-olds who were hearing this for the first time. The four-year-olds, of course, knew about it. Now, I especially remember the walk to Felice's house. His home was very near the school, as, as all the children's were. It was located in a residential and shopping area near where I was living. Thus, I knew many of the merchants with whom we stopped and chatted with along the way. The storekeepers knew about these annual outings and they looked forward to the opportunity to talk with and admire the kids. They often, some of them actually even took them into their stores and in some cases gave them some candy and so on. We also talked with many shoppers on the street both men and women, as we, and as we reached the first busy street on our way to Felice's house. In fact, these conversations seemed to delay our progress from my American perspective, and I wondered if we were ever gonna get to Felice's house. We eventually continued our journey and left the busy thoroughfare, walking down a small street that came to an end in front of the large apartment building where Felice's family lived. As we approached the front door of Felice's building, all the children ran up and were taking turns pressing the bell. Antonio, my partner, was, said I was lagging behind and she pulled away from me so she could go and ring the bell as well. 
Now, when we went in the door, Felice and his younger brother, Marco, peered down over the railing as we climbed up the four flights of stairs to their apartment. The smile on Felice's face was unforgettable. When we arrived, we were greeted by Felice's parents and three of his grandparents. One of his grandfathers had passed away. They were all present for this big day. Felice's parents escorted the teachers into the kitchen while I was pulled off to Felice's room with his brother and with all the other kids. We inspected all of Felice's toys, which included an impressive collection of what they called at this time, e poofy. These are cartoon characters we called Smurfs in the United States. I don't, and they were popular at, at, this, at this time. He, he must have had 200 of these little Smurfs playing soccer, skiing, so on. And then we saw many of the other things in his room and, and, and talked. And then eventually we went off to the kitchen where Felice's mother served a wide variety of very scrumptious and delicious snacks. Before we left, Felice's father pulled me aside and presented me with some homemade wine and salami. I always got special treatment. It was a really good day. For several days after a home visit, the teachers and kids first verbally and then artistically reconstructed the experience. The artwork contained a series of pictures that visually captured the main experiences of the event. The older, the, the older kids like Felice and, uh, drew pictures, large pictures of his, of his room, of the, of the kitchen with the snacks and so on. So there were, there were several pictures of this type. But then all the other children worked on a large mural in which each made different contributions. And I'm going to show you the picture of the mural here. And you can see some kids just cut out, drew and cut out the cars and then put them on the street. Uh, some kids drew the clothes in the windows of the, uh, of the, of the shops. Uh, and you can see that children have drawn individuals, all of us walking as we're, as we're walking to Felice's house. And we look real close in sort of the middle of that line of people. You can see me there. I had a beard at the time. Now, all of these pictures in the mural were prominently displayed in the school. And at the end of the year, they were taken down uh, taken down and taken home by the older children to keep as mementos. Now, this activity captures a theoretical concept of mine, which I call a priming event. I see this as an, by priming events, I, I mean activities that compel children to think about ongoing or coming changes in their life. And this activity surely does that. And in this project, the kids think about, discuss, and artistically reconstruct their relationships with the school, family, community, and each other. They collectively reaffirm the emotional security of these bonds while reflecting on how the nature of these attachments change as they grow older. In the process, the kids gain insight into their changing position in the school, peer, and wider adult culture. And in this project, especially, the older kids are in the in the spotlight, but it's sort of bittersweet, you know. Uh, they enjoy the fact that they went to their home, but they realize now that they're moving on, uh, and they will not be in this school anymore. Also, I should point out that this is a priming event for the for the four and three year old kids. The four year old kids are thinking about how next year it's going. They're be going. We'll, we'll be going to their house, and and of course the three year old kids are experiencing it for the first time. Now, in addition to long-term projects, family involvement in Italy was high in the preschools in both Bologna and Modena. Parents and grandparents were always welcome in the school, and many stayed each morning for a half an hour or so, talking with the teachers, inspecting the children's work uh, in ver on various projects, and interacting with the children. I, I thought this was, uh, again, kind of unusual that, they, they, that they, they stayed around for so long. In both preschools that I've, in all the preschool, in both the preschools I studied in Bologna and Modena, there were end of the year parties 
where children gave singing and dancing performances to large groups of parents and grandparents. In Mona, there was a, both a party for the whole preschool and a special party for each of the, of the age groups. At the party for my age group, the kids performed dancing and singing routines they practiced for many weeks, and the parents and some grandparents also engaged in, a, in certain of, of the dances and participated in games with the kids, as well as prepared a large meal. Okay, I'm now going to end up by talking about the community in peer culture in these different settings. In the private preschools I studied in the United States, the children had little direct involvement with the surrounding community. The children took one or two field trip trips each year to a museum, a botanical garden, or maybe a state park. Now, one reason for such few trips was lack of means of transportation at the centers, and they didn't, since they didn't have buses, and, and renting buses was not easily arranged and was costly. But actually, more importantly, many parents were somewhat concerned with the safety of their children on such field trips. And again, to just be truthful, they felt that they could provide these activities and experiences for their children on their own in the family. Things were quite different in the Head Start centers I studied. Because the children were bused to the Head Start center, the buses and drivers were available to take the kids and their teachers on numerous field trips over the course of the year. Many parents also participated in these events and went on the trips. The kids visited parks, museums, zoos, department stores for Christmas and Easter displays, workplaces like post offices and fire stations, and so on. We can see from this example, from this slide, a field trip to a park. Now, this park was somewhat away from where the Head Start Center was because the parks where the Head Start Center were were not very safe. And there was a lot of drug trafficking and other things going on. So we took a bus there and you can see me with the kids on the slide here. Now the kids were always treated very warmly by the adults they met in these various community contexts, most of whom were not African-American uh, and were from uh, you know, more wealthy backgrounds. And the kids quite simply love these trips and such activities might be taken for granted by many middle and upper class kids, but they were special to the Head Start children. And I think also important in presenting, in, in presenting these kids and Head Start to the community. And it made the kids more visible to other uh, people in the community. Now, my experience with the kids in Modena was especially meaningful for me because I went on, I went on with, I went on with the group to first grade and continued to keep in touch with the four first grade classes throughout their five years of elementary school. As a result, I was able to observe and experience many of the events and activities in Modena in which a strong civic society was constructed around these children and their families. By civic society, I mean a collective celebration of civic engagement people's con connections with participation in their life and the life of their communities. In the United States, examples of such civic society might be neighborhood block parties, bowling leagues, union picnics, ethnic street festivals, and of course the celebration of the 4th of July as, as, as Singapore will be celebrating their Independence Day soon. Although such events still exist in the United States, of course, Many argue that they're fading from the lives of Americans and their children. Civic and, 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 and many sociologists and political scientists have, have written about this, especially a guy named Putman, and argues that America, United States are becoming more and more uh, um, disassociated and doesn't, and, and which has led to, he, he would argue, uh, a, a, a lot of of, of partisan politics and other sorts of views. Now, civic engagement was strong in Modena and often involved and even centered on children. In fact, preschools and elementary schools were often the site and kids the focus of many civic activities. I was first introduced to this type of civic engagement in the celebration of Carnivale, which 
is a really big thing in Italy and in, in the United States, we call it Mardi Gras and it's, it's primarily celebrated uh, in New Orleans. And I was, I, I was introduced to this in my first month in the preschool and there were two days of celebration with the three to five year old children and their teachers in costume, dancing, singing, eating candy and pastries and generally, generally having a great time. Then there was also a general celebration for all Mogna's children, including my eight-year-old daughter and all the kids I studied in the main square of the city. And here kids in a wide variety of colorful costumes gathered with their parents and grandparents to run, play, throw streamers, listen to music and buy candy and other treats from street vendors. This was one of several events that occurred both in the school and in the more general city or community level. Another was a concert of traditional children's songs provided by all the five-year-olds from the preschools for the people of the city. The children prepared for the performance by months of practice under the direction of their music teachers. In addition to regular teachers, they had music teachers in the preschools. And the children had, so, and I saw many of these practices at my preschool and the children had one rehearsal with all kids from throughout the city and the music teachers before the big performance, was a, which was a spectacular and highly successful civic event with many proud parents and grandparents in attendance in the large audience. There, there were hundreds of people at this, at this con uh, concert in the main square. Now, just as important, all the preparation, practice, and pride in the performance made the singing of the songs a key element in the kids' peer culture during the last month in preschool. They often sang or hummed the songs during work projects and free play. I especially remember their singing of the songs at another civic event in the preschool, the Festa di Noni, which was a party for grandparents. At the Festa di Noni, many grandparents of the kids who lived in Modena attended. There were many activities in which the kids and grandparents worked together. Some grandmothers with girls and boys sewed new outfits for the dolls, while other grandmothers went up to the kitchen with a group of kids to make desserts to have with the big meal that the school's cooks were preparing for us. Some grandfathers worked outside in the garden with one group of kids, while another uh, made kites as we see in the next slides. So here's a, a grandmother with her grandson Antonio there whipping up a dessert. The, the little boy next to Antonio is William, who is from Egypt. And of course his grandmother uh, could not be there, but he really liked being with his buddy, Antonio. If you look real close to the left there, you can see my daughter who I brought for the grandparents day watching. The next slide we see the kite making. This is Davide in the front and that's his grandfather who made the kite and his, the other uh, children uh, uh, standing and later we took the kites outside to fly them. Now, what I remember most, however, happened right before our big lunch. The kids sang several of the songs that they had earlier practiced so often and performed for the citywide concert, which had already taken place. I heard these songs over and over and I knew many of them by heart. As the kids sang the first two songs, I sang along with them softly mouthing the words. In the middle of the third song, the kids were sitting in small chairs, laid their arms over each other's shoulders and began to sway with the music. Their faces were beaming. I looked at the grandparents who were misty eyed and so was I. Now I'm going to, hopefully this is gonna work. I'm going to play a video of them singing this song and you'll be able to see the grandparents as well. Oh, it's not working.
got to eat. <laughs> uh, the children in the, in the background with the grandparents were uh, sib younger siblings of the kids. Now I'm gonna finish up. As I noted earlier, I stayed with the children in Modena as they made the transition to elementary school and eventually on to middle school as well. As the community-wide song fest for all the children in the last year of preschool was sort of a marker or a rite of passage or what I call a priming event, a similar event occurred for all the fifth graders five years later. There was a special sports day held on a beautiful spring day held on a beautiful spring day in a large park in Modena. All the groups from each school were gathered in one large group for some discussion about different sport act, sports activities which were set up around the park. The organizers of the event, young and older men and women, then led the kids who all had uh, shirts and, and uh, that represented their schools uh, in some songs and orchestrated movements to some well-known Italian folk and pop music. Now, afterwards, the kids were set free to explore the different sports activities, often with their parents following along as spectators, as we see in some of the next slides. So in this slide, there's a girl from that was in Chiara, who was in the preschool where I, uh, where I observed and then later uh, uh, in the elementary school. And she's learning a bit about windsurfing here. Uh, in the next slide, they're learning about boxing. That little boy is my colleague, Luisa Molinari's son at the time. He's all grown up, of course, now. Uh, and there were over 20 or 25 of these uh, different sports uh, activities. And many of them were sports clubs that were available in the city. And a number of children did uh, uh, actually go on to uh, participate in these, these kind of clubs. Now, near the end of the afternoon, several men parachuted into the park to mark the importance of the event, as we see in this last slide. They're, they're coming in, he's gonna land right on that hill there. It was a great day and it certainly contributed to the kids' peer culture, as well as the civil society of Modena. And I will end with that slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Thanks for sharing all those lovely stories of the children in the classrooms, but also their works. Um, so I'd like to just open the floor to invite our participants, our teachers and friends to um, either raise questions or just share a comment or two. You may type in the chat box or just unmute yourself just to speak up. Um, Bill, may I ask you to stop sharing your your slides so that we can see everybody's faces, at least yeah, those so, who have switched on their cameras? Yeah, so I just hit stop share on the... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so now you just see me. Is that yes, okay? That's okay. <laughs> hey, and we, we get to see other people's faces as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. And invite friends and colleagues who have comments or questions you'd like to ask Bill. This is the time to do so. I'd like to see faces. Nope, if you're too shy, you can just type a sentence or two in the chat. That's fine too. So that we know if you know you've found this to be useful, interesting, if any of this is different from Singapore. And because it's year end, I know um, that centers are also preparing for their graduation concerts. 
also what mm. Bill had shared today about the priming events for some of the students, the five-year-olds who are getting ready for primary school. Um, so home visit was one of those priming events or transitional mm. events, you know, as the, the older children get ready um, to leave their preschool and to join a new school. And then um, Bill also shared some photographs of the fifth graders. I suppose fifth graders also have some kind of celebration at the end of the year. And that whole, you know, sports day event was one way in which they did so. Yeah, Lithia, go ahead. Yes. Hi, Bill. Um, I really Hi. enjoyed that whole um, series of different experiences that you've that you've accumulated in your rich path. And I'm also, my thoughts are lingering around um, the complexities of the dispute resolutions and the peace yeah. negotiations that you shared about earlier that happened differently in different cultures. Um, and, and how much adults may or may not come into the picture for that. So I'm also trying to relate that possibly to uh, attitudes and perspectives, maybe in our local context with Singapore. And if we didn't know where to start, um, thinking about then where the adult stands in this whole thing, what's, what would be your sentiment about where to begin thinking about whose responsibility it is to enable this complexity to come alive for children of different ages? Yeah, I... I... I think that this whole there's been some some interesting developments in 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 general, not just in regard to preschool education, but about children in conflict um, in, in 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 by developmental psychologists um, who for a long time again conflict was kind of seen in this negative way, uh, and now it is seen as uh, something that can have a lot of positive aspects in regard to children uh, learning to settle conflicts and learning to about other points of view and so on, and that they're never really going to get the opportunity if parents or our, our teachers are uh, doing it for them and entering uh, uh, too soon. Um, as I said, um, this decision to do so uh, in the American schools was much reflected uh, in what the parents wanted and the parents were paying, okay? Um, but it, it's, it's also a cultural thing. Um, it, it, um, I, I have a paper where I just looked at the, the children's uh, friendships comparing uh, the Head Start kids and the tagging kids and the American kids whole the whole nature of conflict in regard to their friendships and American kids um, because their conflicts are often settled for them uh, tend to be very thin-skinned uh, say things like in the example that I gave you like you're hurting my feelings or, or run to the teacher ask for help a lot of times it's hard for the teacher to know what really happened okay uh, and so their solutions are somewhat arbitrary, like saying you have to all share or you have to let someone play. The teacher in the example I gave in American school here um, was a, a, a little more, really quite a bit more uh, careful about this than, than teachers sometimes are. Um, and, but I find, you know, the, the whole no nature of conflict are, just, just the nature of the interaction, teasing or um, raising your voice and so on. This, this, this is sort of a, self, uh, a, a frequent thing in the Italian schools. Uh, Italians like to discuss and debate things. This is the same for Head Start kids. They have a kind of a oppositional talk where they like to tease each other uh, about things. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> This causes a problem, though, when they go on to first grade, because the dominant culture in the United States does not have this oppositional culture, whereas for the Italian kids, this is very much a part of having this discussion and 
in, in teasing and debating and so on. So the transition is better. So I have been encouraged at least that we've seen uh, more work both in the fields of education and developmental psychology about conflict should not be seen so negatively and that kids need the opportunity uh, to settle disputes and, and, it's, and, it's, and, and it's not going to hurt them once in a while to get into a conflict, as, especially if we're, we're talking just about debating and, and so on. Um, and especially in the United States, I think this is important too, as our culture becomes more diverse, uh, which it is for people not to misunderstand uh, one type of, of interactive style uh, for another. So, like I said, I think that, and, and, and again, today's talk is a little different for me because I'm focusing more on the adult child relations, but I, when I focus more on pure culture, I, I've always kind of taken the position as better that teachers, especially in the free play activities, to only kind of enter at the last resort. Uh, and, 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 and we find that, that there's less disruption of pure culture and that children learn uh, to deal with these things better themselves. Absolutely. Thank Thanks you. for some of the other comments that I was reading. Yeah, Bill, if you're able to see the um, comments in the chat box, there's um, somebody, uh, Winnie says that she thinks, you know, we face similar problems in Singapore, especially mm -hmm. in letting children have the time to work out their conflicts without any intervention from the educators. Um, and Pesha, yeah, I, did you want to say something to that? Yeah, I was just, you know, in the United States, it's it's not, you know, you, you, Singapore is somewhat similar because you mainly have private preschools, okay? Um, and so the parents are paying, so that, that can affect this. But in the United States as well, there, there's really not, you know, and I'll, I'll let you respond uh, about Singapore, but respect for the importance of preschool teachers is very, very low. Uh, they're paid very poorly, even though many of them are very well trained and especially the ones that are in the, the for-profit, uh, non-for-profit preschools are well trained but they're paid very poorly. They have little respect. Um, their, their jobs are quite different in regard to, in comparison to elementary school teachers uh, in terms of even elementary school teachers could be respected more, but they're respected much more uh, than preschool kids uh, than preschool teachers. And the United States is still, there's a large segment of the population I would say 25% or so that at least, I don't know if this is a political stand or they really believe this, but have this notion that kids should be at home with their mothers until, until uh, kindergarten, which uh, is one year before first grade, uh, and think that the, the parents can do a better job of this. Now, of course, this is very un, unrealistic in the United States because of the large percentage of mothers of working, of single parent families, uh, and so on. Uh, but again, we have, a, you know, a pretty strong segment of the society that just do not see the value of preschool education uh, and also do, do not realize the change of, of the fact that kids, you know, if they're, if they're at home, not, not in preschool, there are not that many children around to play with anymore and they have fewer siblings and so on. So just being exposed to a pure culture, if you wanna put the educational aspect of it aside, the nature of their childhoods is much more restricted if they're, if they're not attending uh, a, a preschool. Uh, and, and, and again, that is, 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 is fairly poorly recognized by uh, especially conservative segments of, of the society in the United States. There's a lot of criticism of this Head Start program as, you know, there are studies that show that the kids, you know, if you follow them along by third grade, they're not doing all that much better than kids who didn't go to Head Start. But 
there's all kinds of problems with these studies because it doesn't take into account all the kind of intervening factors which could have affected that, that outcome. But again, there's this sort of notion that I only want to pay for my kids. <laughs> and I don't want to start paying for, for public education until kids are in, in first grade. And so, uh, and as we've seen, you know, we just passed a major bill in the United States finally uh, to do some good things, but early education and, and uh, family leave didn't make it. Uh, so we're still stuck with where we're at, uh, where some states provide uh, 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 pretty good opportunities and, and, and things for this. Some employers provide uh, family leave, but we're still very, very far behind. And what we provide, and especially behind in respecting the real importance of early education teachers. Uh, and I, I would include a, a uh, elementary school in there, but especially preschool. And this isn't the case in Italy. I mean, the preschool teachers, elementary school teachers, they, they, they paid the same salary. Um, uh, they're respected. They have a lot of respect. Uh, um, and, and, and that's true of, of much of Europe uh, as well. It's just not, it's just not Italy. That's true of, of, of most countries in, in Europe. So I, I don't know if that holds for uh, Singapore or, or not. Well, Bill, I can see three questions. If it's okay, we'll just um, try and address the three remaining questions in turn. One is about, uh, Judy has a question about whether excessive adult intervention in children's conflicts may affect their social behavior as they grow up. Whether you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, for me, it, it, you know, it, 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 you, you know, it's hard to do the work because you know it's hard to follow children growing up. But uh, we we do know that if children, you know, this is kind of an issue in general in the United States too, uh, regarding you know, like what they call helicopter parents or parents who are always kind of looking after their kids and and uh, overprotecting them and so on are, you know, how is that gonna affect the kids when they get older? Now, and, and there have been studies that show that, that these children feel entitled, that they do uh, have uh, problems in, in friendships and so on, but there's really not enough work done in this area uh, to know. Um, we, we do know that, that also that if, if, if this kind of fear of conflict, uh, uh, our, our fear of having, uh, expressing a disagreement, um, to me can lead, this is just my opinion, it's not so much studied, but I also, there have been this study of this breakdown, as I said, of civic society in the United States, that there's a lot of misconception, a lot of, uh, of people not knowing their neighbors and not not you know being afraid to voice their opinions about things uh and we certainly have a lot of violence in the united states and and so on so you know my feeling is 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 that you know being seeing conflict as as natural seeing differences of opinion as natural seeing being able to work these things out and not having it done for you uh, or expecting it to be done for you uh, uh, to me can have a lot of negative conflicts, uh, negative implications for children's development, but also for our societies more generally. Uh, um, but again, not everybody, of course, would necessarily agree for, with me and to try to get money to study this sort of thing wouldn't be so easy as well. But like I said, we have seen more studies coming from developmental psychologists who tend to be able to get more money to do their research, uh, trying to look at conflict in a, in, in a more positive way. Uh, and so we, have, so we have seen, but these studies don't, aren't usually longitudinal, but we have seen a, an openness to seeing that as important uh, for not only social development, but for even for cognitive de development. So I, I don't know if I tried to answer the first question about conflict as best I can. Uh, 
Yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of ongoing work done. So I want to go back to a question uh, from Jacqueline, one of the earlier questions. Um, my colleague Jacqueline, who's asking uh, how mm -hmm. you managed to convince the schools to let you in um, for your studies. Yes, I really didn't talk about my methodologies at, at all here. Um, uh, my work began um, many years ago in a postdoc at, at Berkeley. Um, and there um, I was able to get access primarily uh, through sponsors. Um, uh, one, to my, one of my mentors, my dissertation advisors, had a very close relationship with the director of a, uh, a university. It was a, a preschool, it was a university preschool uh, in Berkeley. And there had been research in this preschool before, but it was all, they have experimental rooms or the research was all experimental. But he was, he, he was able to <laughs> convince this woman to let me come in. And, and I, at this time, nobody had ever done any videotaping of young children. I was the first to do that. Um, and I, you know, I was very well prepared in how I presented myself. Uh, and accepted by the different, what I would call caretakers, who I had to deal with, uh, the director of the center, the teachers, the people that work there, the parents, and of course, to get ex accepted by the children. And, and this was a very long process. I outline it in, mu in much of my work, how this came about. After that, uh, in different settings, um, in Italy, again, it was, I knew uh, there was some Italian colleagues who I knew from, I had met at some conferences and they uh, had read some of my work. And so they uh, went, uh, introduced me to uh, different preschools, first in Bologna and then in Modena. Uh, and again, in, in every case, the, the teachers were very open uh, in Italy because this was something um, that had not been done before. There had, 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 again, very little research in the schools and especially not someone joining them. And again, the way I sort of go about things, I develop, you know, good rapport uh, with kids and when I, in Italy, it was actually much easier to, to get accepted by the children because I was an incompetent adult. My Italian wasn't the best. And this was, this really helped after I got into the schools. Um, and uh, then the, the children realized I could actually speak better with them, speak better Italian with them than I could with, with the teachers. and then that made them feel closer to me and, uh, and their parents became very interested and, and so on. So in, in all schools, it, there's usually the head start. Um, I had to basically make a request uh, at a particular uh, head start center. Uh, and it was decided by the director of the center uh, and their my background and what I'd accomplished before and being a professor at Indiana, but, but also, you know, being able to tell them about these previous studies and so on. So the studies built on one another. Now, and I'll just make this kind of comment. People, sociologists especially, who do ethnographic research like I do, normally do not stay in the same area, okay? And I've done, stayed in the same substantive area for 50 years. Uh, and so then, you know, so, so people will say, you know, while well, your sample size is small, well, it starts to get pretty large when you do it over a 50 year period and, and, and over different countries and different ethnic group and, and racial groups and so on. But that's unusual for ethnography and sociology. You know, um, I know some ethnographers who have studied children and then they went off to study something else. That was, it was just one of many kinds of ethnographies they do. On the other hand, this is not the case for anthropology. Most anthropologists, if they study a particular culture, they study that culture for very long periods of time. They go back and back and back. Uh, and so 
So you, you build on that, so you, you generate theoretical ideas and in, in a particular area, rather than kind of jumping from one thing to another. And you also improve, I think, your ethnographic skills through the different experiences you have in different places. So, and this is something, of course, I, as I, say, I teach ethnography that I try to pass on to my students, but it's still fair to say that most ethnography and in, in sociology in the, in the United States and elsewhere is, is not this kind of longitudinal or staying in the same area uh, that mine is. Uh, but I think it's, it's a better way to do ethnography in terms of really uh, building theory in a particular area. It doesn't have to be on, on, on children. In my case, it was, but it, it, could, it could be in a number of different areas. And there are some uh, sociologists who have stuck uh, uh, into one area. But again, that's, uh, that's, a, that's somewhat unusual. Also, to do comparative work is, is and, and even, even to learn another language <laughs> is unusual in American sociology. Um, it's becoming more, it's becoming more uh, common, but, but uh, still uh, an exception until um, uh, uh, recently. Um, there's also kind of a misconception in soci sociological ethnography about anthropological ethnography. That, that they think that um, anthropologists, when they go off to study a particular culture, that they're totally fluent in the language. That's, that's, not, that's not usually the case. They're learning the language as they're learning the culture, OK? Much like I did in, in, in Italy, my, my Italian was not so good. Uh, I knew some Italian. That's why I wanted to go to at least my heritage is Italian. But still, it was you know I, I was far from fluent when I started, and and that's true of of most anthropologists. So there's that there's also that kind of misconception, and that in a way that's the best way to learn a language is to be in the culture, okay, and not this notion that you learn the language before you begin. Uh, and ethnography is not it's not generally the case. Think, there is one one last question before we all go. Um, I okay. think it's by Elaine. Elaine, I wonder if you would like to unmute and just rephrase your question, maybe quicker that way. Elaine, are you there? Nope, she might be. Preoccupied. I'm not exactly sure what she's asking, but I think it's just um, that due to cultural differences, schools seem to have different ways to support children's social emotional development. And she's wondering if there might be just common qualities, common practices that should fit all cultural right. contexts. Yes. Um, well, I, I I think that that. It, if you know, even in the examples I gave, while there were differences, there there were you know some similarities in regard to the natures of the curriculum, uh, the ideas of uh, the idea of of, of, of <clears throat> exposing children uh, to literacy, to being appreciative of free play and and peer culture, even though again I think. It was more apparent in 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 Italy and to know about it, but the idea that preschool, depending on how many years you're in preschool, but even if just for one year, it should not be seen just as as preparation for first grade. That especially in terms of of, of social and and communicative skills and language skills, uh, that. Uh, that these are in, in, important uh, uh, and processes, and 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 that we can have different kinds of curriculums, but all you know the most do uh, recognize that, but but not all. Uh, and uh, you know, I I've kind of just in riding around in Singapore, I will see a preschool, and sometimes they'll have the name of. The, the founder of the curriculum, like a Montessori or, or uh, 
uh, different names on there that they're following, okay, Gardner or others. Um, and and they, there, there will be differences, but the important point in, in all of these is, is, is to, to give children experiences uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a somewhat holistic sort of way, uh, but, but they differ in matter of, of emphasis, okay? Uh, and, 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 and this is sort of a decision that's gonna be made, if it's private, it's gonna be made by the parent. Uh, if it's in a public uh, uh, preschool, like in Italy, there's, the, the curriculum is, is, is something that's you know, decided by the educational system. Uh, and uh, so in the United States, to, you know, as long as we're, if we actually had passed some bill which provided money, it was going to, the whole issue of what the curriculums were going to be and, and, uh, and uh, was something that was not really talked about very much. It was just like this would maybe take care of itself <laughs> and, it, and it, it doesn't. And, and then again, as you saw, my criticism of Head Start, I, I didn't particularly like the curriculum at all, <laughs> but I did like a lot of other things that was going on in there that wasn't part of the farm curriculum. So uh, again, these are things that, you know, um, as, as, the, as you have a history and have you, as, as you have a lot of uh, tradition of early education, especially as we've seen in Europe, European countries, then, then we, we see uh, curriculums grow, we see debate, we see a lot of research and publications about it. Uh, but, but this lags more uh, in the United States compared, uh, compared to Europe. Uh, although, again, there, there, are, there, there is more work on early education uh, in the United States, but it's, but it's much limited compared to uh, uh, research on, on uh, the higher grades. Thanks so much, Bill. I think that okay. works. Uh, Elaine said she, she's, she apologizes. She can't come to the microphone and she's in the hospital. But you know, yeah, we're just happy that she was able to join and, and ask a question. So um, if there is I nothing- I want to thank everybody else, for listening. Yeah, everybody's well. And uh, we, we hope to see you at the next lecture. Thank you very much. Have a good okay. rest of the day. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Oh, we are going to see you bye. soon again.